Let's start with this attack, this Iranian attack on Israel. What's going on in the mind of Iranians? Why they're attacking directly? Iran had been um, operating in an environment where they had at least publicly yielded de deterrence superiority to Israel. And what that meant is that Iran would absorb um, insults, uh, physical insults, uh, attacks by Israel on its interests and not respond openly. <clears throat> See, the key thing about deterrence is it can't be unspoken because you don't deter anybody if you keep what you're going to do secret. Uh, but Iran you know, looked at the, the larger picture of where it was at vis-a-vis um, -vis the regional security uh, posture and, and you know, geopolitical structures. And <clears throat> I think it recognized that the axis of resistance that it had helped create and was sustaining was successful. It was successful in terms of uh, pushing back against the American-led uh, Sunni uh, conglomerate um, and it was successful in pushing back against, um, you know, Israeli motivated um, policies in the region. Uh, it wasn't successful in, in Palestine, so to say, but, uh, you know, that, that is what it is. Um, the, the Iranians also were reconfiguring how they um, operate with the world. They were breaking out of the uh, sanctions uh, era. Um, by normalizing relations with Saudi Arabia, a major oil producer, uh, which means that now Saudi Arabia and Iran will be coming up with um, coordinated energy policies that are linked to common interests defined by BRICS. They are both now new members of the BRICS forum. Um, and so, you know, Iran's looking at the big picture saying, we're doing, we're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty good. We don't need to upset the apple cart by starting a major war with Israel uh, because an Iranian retaliation for many of the insults that Israel has thrown its way um, could lead to a major conflict, not just with Israel, but with the United States. And again, the conflict with the United States would require Iran to undertake certain actions like shutting down the Strait of Hormuz, perhaps attacking American military infrastructure in the region. This could trigger um, America's Sunni Gulf Arab allies getting involved, which means there could be mutually assured destruction of Iranian and Gulf Arab oil production infrastructure, which leads to economic catastrophe for the world, uh, which leads to the ruin of Iran. Um, and so they just, they wisely said, we don't need to do that. But at some point in time, the insults become too big. And what you have is a, is two things. One, you have Iran having committed together with the axis of resistance to <clears throat> enable Hamas's continued um, resistance against Israel in Gaza. Uh, this had become a strategic imperative for Iran. Linked to that was a meeting that Iran was holding in, uh, in Damascus at their consulate. It's a diplomatically inviolable building. Now, people would say, well, why were they holding the meeting in a consulate? Doesn't that make the consulate a target? Um, I don't mean to be insulting to people. I'm really trying to change my ways, but that's really just stupid thinking, um, especially if you're an American, because you do understand every American embassy abroad uh, that's in any um, place of geopolitical significance has a CIA station whose job it is to carry out intelligence actions against the host nation and against regional powers. Um, <clears throat> just so you understand what I'm talking about, in Germany, one of our ostensible allies, uh, the CIA oversees espionage against the German government. We listen in on a regular basis on the phone calls of senior German government officials. We spy on the German military. We spy on German industry. Um, that's just what we do. Um, and our military, likewise, does planning in the embassy structure. We have defense attache offices. We have defense officials uh, who receive delegations from abroad, uh, uh, from the United States to do planning about 
um, things that we don't want the host nation to know about or the region to know about. <clears throat> so if you sit there and say, well, that Iranian consulate was a legitimate target, so too is every American embassy in the world. So too, therefore, is the embassies of just about every power that has intelligence and military interests in the world. Um, so let's knock off the nonsense about you know, what the Iranians were doing was unforgivable and holding a planning session. The Iranians were holding a planning session related to what the next phase of operations of their axis of resistance would be in regards to countering Israel's ongoing genocide against the population of Gaza. The Israelis found out about it and the Israelis attacked it. Um, but a consulate isn't just, you know, diplomatically involved. It's, it's the sovereign territory of Iran. Just like an American embassy is the sovereign territory of the United States, the consulate building that was attacked was Iranian soil by law. And the Iranians said, we can't allow an attack against Iran. That's always been one of our red lines, <clears throat> a direct attack. Um, and so they had no choice but to challenge Israel's deterrence supremacy um, in a way that actually flipped the script and gave Iran deterrence supremacy, meaning that Iran now had to send a signal to Israel that <clears throat> the price you're going to pay for attacking Iran uh, will be extreme. Um, and therefore, we will deter you from taking that action based upon your, your knowledge of the certainty of action, that we will, we will behave in a certain way. So the attack that had to be launched against Israel in retaliation for their assault on the consulate had to be of a scope and scale that established deterrence. Um, it had to send a signal, a clear signal to the Israelis about the price that would be paid for additional or further actions of this nature. But the Iranians had to carry out this in a way that didn't provoke the inevitability of a uh, Israeli you know, response to their response. So it was a carefully tailored uh, uh, strike designed to show potential um, <clears throat> without um, doing excessive harm. And it succeeded. Uh, Israel, thanks to its cooperation with the United States, uh, has one of the most modern, uh, thoroughly integrated ballistic missile defense systems in the world. Um, the United States enhanced this defensive capability by plugging in our own ground-based ballistic missile defense um, materiel, the uh, the ANTP ANTPY2 X-band radar, <coughs> together with the FAD missile system, together with Advanced Patriots, uh, integrated with Israeli Arrow 2, Arrow 3, David Sling, the Iron Dome, and their radars. The U.S. Navy came in and plugged in um, at least two Aegis-equipped uh, uh, destroyers that have the ability to track missiles and fire missiles to shoot down missiles. Um, all of this was there, and Iran launched an attack that uh, penetrated all of these defenses. We now have a better understanding of what Iran achieved. Um, they struck two Israeli air bases, uh, Nevatim and Ramona. Um, they hit them with multiple missiles. Um, <clears throat> they struck a command and control facility in Tel Aviv. The Israelis aren't talking about this, but a missile hit Tel Aviv. They struck an intelligence facility in the Golan Heights. The Israelis aren't talking about this because apparently it was struck uh, multiple times. <clears throat> and in addition to that, they took out at least five, more than likely many more, uh, ballistic missile defense sites, that is the launchers and radars on the ground that Israel were, was using. Um, they did this without inflicting um, serious casualties. Uh, no civilian casualties were noted. We don't know if any life was lost in the Golan. Nobody's talking about that yet. We don't know what happened uh, with the command and control site in Tel Aviv. <clears throat> but the, the word is that nobody lost their lives at these two airfields. And that, again, shows that the Iranians were carefully selecting their targets to make a point as opposed to produce a result. Um, so the Iranians did this. They carried, they carried this out. That was the purpose of the attack. It was to reset deterrence superiority in the Middle East away from Israel onto Iran. In your opinion, why Iran didn't do this by using Hezbollah, other groups that they are working with them closely, 
and why they decided to do it directly to Israel. Iran is uh, a nation, believe it or not, that um, adheres to international law. Um, <clears throat> in order to use Hezbollah or proxies legally, Iran would have to make a case for collective security. Um, and I don't think Iran wanted to make that case. Uh, it's easier for Iran to articulate a cognizable case for retaliation, simply talking about Article 51. First of all, <clears throat> the attacks that were carried out, uh, probably the only, uh, the attack was done in Damascus, Syria. Probably the only nation that Iran could make a collective security arrangement with as regards to this attack would be Syria. And uh, Iran didn't want to do that. I don't believe the Syrian government wanted to do that as well. <clears throat> so once you say it's an attack against us, of course, you don't have to prove it because the consulate is Iranian territory. So it's an attack against Iran proper. Um, Iran under Article 51 is allowed to strike um, the, 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 the source of the immediate threat. And so in this case, it's the, the uh, air bases where the airplanes took off from that attacked. It's the intelligence site in Golan that uh, collected the intelligence and, dis and, and disseminated the intelligence to the attackers. And it's the command center in Tel Aviv that coordinated this effort, along with specific defense nodes that were used to protect these facilities from attack. All of these under... <clears throat> an argument that is cognizable under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter are legitimate targets. And this is why Iran said we alone have to res can respond, and this is why we had to attack Israel, because the tar Israel's actions um, defined the target set. You have to attack those sites which are directly related to the immediacy of the threat that you're trying to respond to. So if Israel attacked Iran from these territories then Iran or these locations then Iran can only respond to these uh to these locations if they wanted to attack Israel we know that three days before this attack they were talking about be prepared we are coming we are going to attack you and why they decided to choose such a policy before this attack taking place in Israel and and on the other hand, how much the United States knew about the scale of this attack on Israel? Pepe Escobar has reported that um, 72 hours before the Iranians attack, there was a meeting in the Middle East between William Burns, the director of the CIA, <clears throat> and either an intermediary or the Iranians themselves, in which the Iranians said, we are going to attack. Uh and that if the United States gets involved, Iran will attack American um, bases in the region. Burns said that the United States won't get involved. Uh, we're not going to attack Israel, I mean, Iran. And he said that um, the way we keep that in place is that if your attack doesn't kill Israeli civilians, that it's limited only to military targets related to um, what attacked you. And the Iranians said, yes, that'll be the case. Now, by giving the United States advance notice, what Iran was able to do now is tailor a, um, a strike package that only had to prove the point. Look, if you and I meet um, in a bar and you're being a jerk and I want to prove the point that I can kick your butt, I have one of two options. I can kick your butt. Or, but you see, that creates that now we're in conflict. Um, or I can just demonstrate so that you know with absolute certainty that I can kick your butt. I can take my fist and put it on your nose. Despite everything you did to defend yourself, my fist ends up on your nose. And you know that had I wanted to, I would have broken your nose. Or I can break your nose. Um, the Iranians said, we're going to touch the nose of Israel. We're not going to break the nose. Uh, because if I hit you in the nose, you're going to hit me back. Guaranteed, you're going to hit me back. Um, but if I just reach out and touch your nose, you'll say, oh, I don't want a broken nose. I'm going to back off. <clears throat> so that's what Iran was trying to prove. And by letting the United States know this, the United States would tell the Israelis, too, that this is not going to be 
the, the they, they didn't know the targets. The Iranians didn't tell them the targets, but the United States can begin to create a, an environment that helps prevent an irresponsible Israeli counterattack. And the United States did this by flooding the zone with American and European NATO um, military assistance. Uh, airplanes were in the air to shoot down drones. Um, we, we, you know, made sure that all of our intelligence and missile defense capability was available to the Israelis. And, um, and so what the Iranians had to do now is build an attack that could get through all of that um, and still touch Israel. Now, the level to which Iran and the United States colluded on <clears throat> creating what I call the myth of the 99% success, um, it's a little too conspiratorial for me. I, um, I don't have any evidence of everybody's, you know, there's people out there saying that the U.S., you know, worked with the Iranians to build this up. I don't think the Iranians shared any aspect of their um, of their attack plan um, 72 hours in advance. I do believe the Iranians launched drones in a very public fashion. Um, <clears throat> they televised it. <laughs> if it was going to be secret, you would have just launched the drones and shut up. But instead, they're going, here they are. These are the drones. And they even filmed it so you could see what kind of drones it were. Here they come. <laughs> and everybody went, oh. And they looked at a map and they said, those drones fly this fast. You're going to hit Israel in five to six hours. And that gave everybody a chance to say, get ready. They're coming in five or six hours. And then the Iranians went, hey, uh, here come the cruise missiles. We're filming them. This is what they are. And they go, okay, this is the kind of cruise missile they're firing here. What the Iranians didn't do is announce their ballistic missile launches uh, because these were the serious launches. Um, now, the Iranians, when they fired, the, so they fired the drones, they fired the cruise missiles. Uh, to achieve a result. Um, basically, you're, you're, you're testing the enemy to see what their response is. And you're learning a lot about how the enemy works. Remember, just so people understand how Iranian, how good Iranian intelligence is. Back when we were in Afghanistan, we had um, a drone, RQ-176 or something. I don't know the number exactly. But uh, they called it the Beast of Kandahar. There's a big drone that looked like the B-2 bomber, Delta Wing stealth drone. It's the drone that was flying over Abbottabad when uh, Navy SEALs went in to kill bin Laden. It's the drone that sent the imagery down, that famous photograph of Obama and Clinton and everybody sitting there staring at the, the the TV screen of the raid as it goes down. That's the drone that did it, the Beast of Kandahar. And the Beast of Kandahar would also take off and fly over Iranian airspace, in particular to the city of Mashhad. Mashhad is where the Iranians have a whole bunch of underground construction because underneath Mashhad is the National Command Center. So if there's ever going to be a big war, that's where the government leaves Tehran and they go to Mashhad and they go underground. Um, <clears throat> and so the Beast of Kandahar like to fly over and do reconnaissance. And the Beast of Kandahar would take off from Kandahar. Now it's taken off using ground control station. So there's an American crew on the ground there taking it off. There's an Iranian crew waiting outside the fence disguised as goat herders. Maybe they put rocks there with beacons. Who knows what the Iranians did, but they had teams there collecting this information. And then these teams would also monitor once the Beast of Kandahar gets to a certain altitude, it switches over control from the ground station to Nevada, where there's another team out there who takes control and then flies it using satellite connectivity. And the Iranians monitored that, monitored the pass off. So they learned how to take control of the drone at its moment of greatest vulnerability. When the handshake is taking place, the beast of Kandahar reaches out and says, hey, satellite, I'm here. And the satellite reached out and said, hey, beast of Kandahar, what's up, buddy? And then they go to da -da -da -da, give their secret handshake and they pass off connectivity. And the Iranians did that. Now, this is all encrypted by the way, uh, meaning that it's not clear what's happening. If you're listening in, you're just hearing. 
noise like that. But the Iranians were able to take that funky noise, break it down, determine the individual channels, decrypt it, get it all done, and then build their own station. That when the Beast of Kandahar went satellite, the station went block the satellite. We come in and we give the secret handshake. The Beast of Han Kandahar goes, hey, buddy, how you doing? And they go, we're doing well, buddy. Secret handshake. Okay, you got it. And the Iranians went, oh, hell yeah, we got it. And they stole the Beast of Kandahar and they brought it into Iran and they landed it in the desert and they own it now. They were able to reverse engineer it. A lot of the technology of the Beast of Kandahar, the aerodynamic concepts, uh, got turned into the Shahid drones that we see today, the Delta Wing drones, etc. cetera. Um, but my point is, the Iranians are that good. They're really, really good at what they do. They did other stuff to the Israelis during uh, 2006 conflict between Hezbollah and Iran. Um, <clears throat> they were able to break into uh, Israeli secure communications, frequency hopping radar uh, radios, uh, encrypted frequency hopping radios. And they were able to real time break in, decrypt and mimic the voice of the Israeli operator to his accent and his lexicon, the slang that he used. So they broke in and they were able to speak over the radio to Israeli special operators to get them to do an operation prematurely so that they went into an ambush where they were killed by Hezbollah. The Iranians did that. The Iranians are really, really good at what they do. So the Iranians are launching this attack and they're learning how th what's going on. They send the drones in and they're listening to everybody talk. And yes, we think we're talking over encrypted channels. The Iranians have been following the United States forever. Every air operation we run in Syria, every air operation we run in Iraq, every air operation we run against the Houthi, the Iranians are collecting this data. And Americans are the laziest people in the world especially when we're fighting what we consider to be racially inferior people. And we consider all Arabs to be ragheads. Now, the Iranians aren't Arabs, but because we're so stupid, we don't know how to differentiate between Arabs and Iranians. So we call Iranians ragheads, too. And that's how we refer to them. Hajis, ragheads, sand camels, whatever. We, we, we use disparaging words because we don't respect them. And so we're up there. And yes, we're supposed to do things and change it up, but we don't because we get lazy. We're creatures of habit we do the same thing over and the iranians watch the pattern they intercept the communication so they're listening to everything they're listening to all the communications taking place the weapons released they're collecting the signals associated with everything we do all the electronic um, we call it mazent all the electronic signals that are, happen related to war. They're listening. They're monitoring the radars, how the radars operate, who the radars are communicating with, what's happening. They're timing everything. So as a drone flies in, it's on the clock, seeing how they react. When does they fire? When's the first time they fire at the lead drone? If we have five drones coming together, how many drones get through the first wave before they hit it with the second wave? How much time does that take? Once we clear that out and the cruise missile comes in, Who's responding? What time? They're getting the timings down. <clears throat> then they fire the first wave of missiles. These are the older missiles. These are standard ballistic missiles with standard um, separating warhead things. They fire that missile up. There are several of them. And they monitor the tracking. And they watch when the, they start to communicate, targeting data down to the actual interceptor missiles. Then they see what happens when they separate the warhead, how that changes, how the radars distinguish who's talking to who. And then they time when they fire that first launcher and they see it. And they got all that down and they factor that in. They fire the second wave of missiles. The second wave of missiles comes in and they'll come in and they do an interesting thing, you see, because it's still a ballistic missile, but it's going to separate that warhead. And as that warhead comes down towards the target, they know, because they've timed it, when the interceptor is going to go. So right before the interceptor is supposed to fire, this warhead releases decoys. And then all of a sudden, that whole system goes crazy. Because instead of being able to fire at one, they now have 12 that they're firing at. And it confuses the system. And the system's confused. It's firing, but it doesn't know. So this gets overloaded. So now they have to open up the second one. So... The, you know, in, in air defense, you're going to you're going to fire your system here, but you're going to keep this one quiet. 
You don't want the enemy to know about it. So it can shoot down the second wave and you're going to keep the other one quiet. This one thing comes in, releases the decoy warheads, confuses all four have to open up because they're confused now. And the Iranians are going one, two, three, four. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and then they come in with the next warheads and they kill one, two, three, four. You can't shoot them down. Then they send in the next missiles, but these are the ones that aren't ballistic. These are the ones that are going to come take off and then they go hypersonic. They tilt and they accelerate through. And what they learned is nobody's tracking it. And it comes in and it hits Novatum Air Base. Bop, 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 bop. And these aren't even the best missiles Iran has. Those they didn't fire. Iran fired the, the second tier and they got through. So the whole way the Iranians built this attack wasn't designed to create the fiction of America shooting down drones, great victory. Iran doesn't care what Israel thinks. They just want Israel to know that they could reach out and touch them. The Americans, on the other hand, are spinning this thing crazy. We shot down 99%. This is a great victory for the United States. This is a great victory for Israel. And Iran's going, no, see, if Iran wanted, if Iran was playing that game, why would then Iran make the point of saying, no, 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 we, we, we beat you. This isn't a victory. Why would Iran say, well, well wait a minute. We're going we're gonna to release more information about, see, Iran needs to establish deterrence. Deterrence is the certainty of knowledge that if you do something, you will get hit with overwhelming power. How is it deterrence if Iran allows Israel and the United States to believe they committed a great, they, they, they won a great victory? That's not deterrence. So Iran's listening and going, no, guys, you didn't hear us. We fired the Fatah 2 missile. You can't shoot it down. We have deterrence. And America's going, no, 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 no. You didn't hit anything of seriousness. We shot everything down. If you hit anything, it was lucky. No, no. And the Iranians are going, no, this was planned and we'll do it again. See, the Iranians have to make sure people know that when they say they'll do it again, A, they will do it again. And B, they will hit everything they want to hit. That's deterrence. And I think what happened over the course of this weekend is that the politicians got uh, in, in Israel and the United States got voted down by the military people. And what I mean by that is the military people said, guys, Iran beat us. And you're starting to see that now in the West. Financial Times is writing articles, of people coming out and they're just being honest for the first time. And they said, Iran beat us. Iran beat everything we had. This is a problem, not just for Israel, but for the world. Imagine being the Japanese and the South Koreans. Because you know, earlier this month, or earlier this year, North Korea tested a hypersonic intermediate range missile. Uh, with a maneuvering warhead <laughs> and um, everybody is going that's okay our defense system will get it and now you wake up and go wait a minute the iranians just fired missiles that aren't as good as this one and they beat the same system we have we're in trouble the chinese are sitting there going hey taiwan <laughs> look what our buddy iran just did same system america says they're going to defend you with Hot knife through butter, baby. Hot knife through butter. And the Taiwanese are going, damn. And imagine if you're Europe right now, because America said, we got all this fancy missile defense stuff going in. We lied to the Russians about the stuff we put in Poland and Romania. It's really, it's never about Iran. It was always about Russia, but it's really good. We got the Russians beat. We built all these new things. And the Russians are going, hey, uh, our stuff's like really better than what the Iranians used. You have no defense. And everybody woke up today and said, we have no defense. So what do you do when you're these nations and your defense has been shown to be a house of cards? The modern Maginot line doesn't really exist, does it? You have to establish deterrence supremacy, not by saying that we can defend against anything you have. You have to flip the script and say, okay, but we can hit you 10 times harder than you can hit us. Now we're back into sort of, you know, the bully mode. And that's what happened in Israel. They, they, they know now that, it, that Iran won the deterrence game. And Israel can't live in a Middle East where Iran has deterrence supremacy. Uh, it doesn't matter that Iran's not an aggressive nation. When was the last time Iran invaded another nation? Um, you know, they, that's not in Iran's playbook. Um, but we, of course, have sold Iran to be a regional aggressor who's out to dominate the world. They're not. 
uh, they're not even out to export the revolution anymore. That gave they gave up on that a long time ago. Iran just wants to live in peace and harmony with its neighbors, but it can't live in peace and harmony with an Israel that's always blowing it up and bombing it. So Iran flipped the script, but we can't trust Iran to do the right thing. It was amazing how we trusted Israel with uh, deterrence supremacy for so many years because we just backed them up. We allowed them to kill people, bomb things. We never once said, hey, rein it in, slow down. We just let them do it. Uh, and Iran got tired of it, so now they have it. And now we mirror image our fears onto Iran saying, well, no, well, that means Iran's going to do all this bad stuff and we're not going to be able to retaliate. So we have to send a signal to the Iranians that we won't put up with this. And so Israel now is planning an attack against Iran. Will they carry it out? That's a political question that I can't answer right now. But we know that that discussion is taking place inside Israel as we speak. We know that the war cabinet has said we want to attack. They even said within 48 hours they want to attack. Will they attack? I don't know. Um, it's insanity if they do. Um, there's some breaking news coming out about uh, Iran saying that if Israel attacks them or continues to threaten them with attack, that Iran may reconsider its nuclear policy, meaning that Iran may in fact become a nuclear power. Um, this is extraordinarily frightening stuff. Um, so, you know, we live in a very dangerous world right now. Very, very dangerous world. If Iran can saturate the air defense system of Israel with 300 their own missiles, and if they increase the quantity and quality of their weapons that they, they they have been using in this attack, and on the other hand, how what do we know about the Iranian army, Iranian capabilities, if any sort of escalations take place in that region? Well, I mean, we we saw that Iran could build a maneuvering warhead that hits its target. <coughs> We saw Iran can incorporate decoy technology in a way that's in a level of sophistication that can overwhelm the most sophisticated air defense radars in the world. Um, we know that Iran has been preparing for this kind of fight for years. Um, the Iranians are some of the most capable military minds in the world today. Uh, very professional people. We we often denigrate them, especially the the. Iranian Revolutionary Guard Command as being fanatics, you know, just being a bunch of dumb idiots who like to beat themselves once a year on the back as they celebrate Karbala. And, uh, and then they run around and they beat their head against the wall because they're just too stupid to do anything else. <clears throat> and yet, if you study the history of Iran's nuclear program, um, the, the man who was in charge of collecting centrifuge technology and then turning it into an enrichment reality was an Iranian Revolutionary Guard Command General. Um, <clears throat> the IRGC has connectivity with uh, various universities in Iran, uh, so they have access to some of the finest academic minds, and they train them specifically to defeat the problems that are manifested by the West's continued anti-Iranian postures. The Iranians are very, very smart. They have been watching how we operate. I've already mentioned that. They know everything about how we fight. They've been watching us in Afghanistan. They've been watching us in Iraq and Syria. Um, they have close connectivity with the Russians. So they're um, kept up to speed on you know, the latest technological developments on the battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, this has all been absorbed by the Iranians and they have developed um, you know, military technology and military methodology that's designed to, uh, to address this. Uh, what we haven't been doing is training to fight the Iranians because we don't respect them, because we don't give them credit, because we just assume that they're, they're not as technologically advanced. Uh, we automatically assume that our air forces will control the skies over, over Iran. Um, that's an assumption I wouldn't want to make if I were either an American or an Israeli, because the Iranians are very smart. And they understand the importance of air defense, and I believe that they will have developed <coughs> technologies and methodologies that are designed to address the threats that manifest themselves, to include the F-35, the F-22, F-15Es. Um, I wouldn't want to go to war against the Iranians today. Um, you know, in the 1980s, had we gone to war against Iran, we would have beaten them. 
not that they weren't brave, they're extraordinarily brave, but they didn't have the capacity to stand up to the combination of factors that a modern Western army brought to bear on the battlefield. The Iranians have been studying the modern Western military for you know, three decades now, and they've been building weapon systems that are specifically designed to overcome this. The, the notion of automatic Western technological supremacy over Iran is absurd. The Iranians have weapons, I think, that would shock the living daylights out of us. Um, the level of technology, the level of understanding um, is beyond our, our willingness to, to concede to Iran. Because again, we are inherently racist. We don't respect the Iranians. We we use names, we call them names, and we just make certain assumptions based upon that name, those names that the Iranians aren't as good as we are. I think the Iranians are just as good as we are. In some cases, they may be a little bit better. If we have some escalations between Iran and Israel, as you mentioned that Israel wants to attack Iran in the next 48 hours, and do you think in these escalations, is there any possibility for Israel going nuclear? Yes, <clears throat> there's a distinct possibility. Um, and there's a, I'd go even further. There's a probability that, uh, that this could happen. Um, if, if Israel starts, if Israel retaliates, maybe we could call the first retaliation um, an effort at uh, actual uh, de-escalation on the part of Israel, meaning that they need a face-saving mechanism out of this. They're going to reach out and they're just going to do something superficial. Um, <clears throat> but the Iranians have made it clear that they're serious about uh, retaining uh, deterrent superiority over Israel, meaning that they want Israel to know that if you do that, there will be a response. So then the Iranians will respond. At that point in time, Israel now realizes that it either concedes deterrence supremacy to Iran, or it now has to double down. No more face-saving mechanisms. They're now going to be talking about real deliberate attacks against Iran. And the sites that they will probably attack are Iran's nuclear infrastructure. Now, at that juncture, Iran has a decision to make. Do we wait for Israel to attack our nuclear infrastructure, and then we retaliate against Israel's nuclear infrastructure? Or... And then the other thing is, you know, the Iranians are smart enough to know that no defense is perfect. And while they have prepared to receive an attack, uh, they also have to accept the fact that Israel, <clears throat> and having been planning this attack for many years, will actually hit the targets they want to hit, how they want to hit them, with what they want to hit them, and achieve the results they want, which is the destruction of certain capabilities. So do you preempt that by building a nuclear weapon. And Iran has said that they're considering that. And if they're considering that, that means they've actually, they have the plans in place. And I will tell you right now that, you know, just looking at Iran's enrichment capability, understanding uh, the their, their industrial base, these are people who have already learned how to uh, work with uranium metal. Uh, they used to build fuel plates for um for use at, uh, at the Tehran uh, test reactor, um, you know, that they'll have no problem building uranium or, 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 or you know, forging uranium metal. Um, they don't have to make an implosion device. They just have to make a gun device. They can steal the design that's on the books of the uh, South African nuclear weapon. Uh, they can do a crude gun design uh, and they can have that up and running inside of two weeks. Um, and they can put it on a warhead that's now attached to a missile they know is going to hit its target. <clears throat> so we live in a very dangerous world right now, one where Iran has the ability, if they choose to do so, to rapidly create nuclear weapons in an environment where people are talking about the use of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> what will Israel do if Iran hits Demona? What will Israel do if Iran hits its Jericho, uh, uh, Jericho launch sites, if Iran hits... Uh, you know, intelligence sites used for targeting. Um, in the United States, we have a doctrine that says if somebody targets our critical nuclear infrastructure, that that warrants um, a preemptive nuclear strike. And so a hacker comes in and tries to prevent strategic command from communicating with bomber wings, missile wings, 
uh, we can treat that as a threat worthy of a nuclear response. Um, I would imagine Israel has a similar policy that if their nuclear enterprise is being threatened with attack, that they can use nuclear weapons as a way of uh, making it clear that a continuation of that will not be tolerated. So, you know, we're, we're moving out of the realm of theoretical uh, into a realm of distinct probability. It's a very scary time. It's a very dangerous time. It's a time when we need mature heads to come together and talk about not just the theory of disarmament, but the actual application of disarmament theory on reality. And the first thing that needs to happen is we need to remove nuclear weapons from the equation of the Israeli-Iranian conflict. Uh, the United States needs to tell Israel that uh, it won't sit by and allow Israel to uh, threaten the use of nuclear weapons, that in fact, Israel must declare its nuclear weapons program and oversee the dismantling of its nuclear weapons program under international supervision. And then we need to turn to the Iranians and say, while that's happening, you cannot build. In fact, we have to come in and, and impose a monitoring regime on you to ensure that you don't convert your uranium into uh, weapons. Um, we're at that stage where the United States needs to take this case to Russia and China, who are close allies of Iran, and say, if we're going to throttle down Israel, you got to help us throttle down Iran, that we need to solve this thing. The interesting thing is, if we can do that, then maybe we can use the same theories against Pakistan and India, and then use the same theories against you know, North Korea, together with China, Russia, and the United States on Pacific region nuclear disarmament, and then work with the United States and NATO and Russia to achieve disarmament. It'd be nice if we could start moving in the direction of uh, getting rid of all nuclear weapons. Until now, I think the collective population of the world has been sleepwalking, um, <clears throat> operating, living in a dream world where they just didn't feel nuclear weapons were a threat. Nuclear weapons are a threat. And uh, it's, you know, the consequences of a nuclear conflict between Iran and Israel will be global and will be devastating. And uh, none of us want to have to have the opportunity to live through it. We need to nip it in the bud right now. Scott, we know that Joe Biden, he's not agreeing with Israel to attack Iran. And do you think how much that would affect the Israelis and their policy? Right now, he doesn't agree to it because he's under the impression that this is still a containable problem and that by removing American assistance to Israel and attacking Iran from the table, <clears throat> that we have some sort of leverage over Israel. But if Israel determines that it has to take an action, the United States, I don't believe, will stand by and let Iran retaliate large without an American response. Um, and the other thing you have to understand is our military has been working with the Israelis for at least two years, probably longer, in developing joint attack plans against Iran. These plans exist. The units have been earmarked. It's not theoretical. It's ready to implement now. And if we get into a situation where Iran is sending missiles into Israel and doing real harm to Israel, um, my guess is that uh, Joe Biden will give an order um, authorizing the implementation of whatever attack plan has been agreed to, and we will participate in a strike against Iran, which is another reason why, from an Iranian perspective, possessing the nuclear weapon would be good. Because if Iran let the world know that if you bomb us, we nuke you, and we know you're going to nuke us, that's mutually assured destruction. But um, <clears throat> just letting you know that if you attack us, we're going to nuke and that should hopefully stop this, but the arrogance of, uh, of Israel, and to be honest, the arrogance and hubris of an American president in a presidential election cycle, do we really want to see Iran uh, challenge Joe Biden, knowing that if Joe Biden is perceived as weak, he wouldn't have any chance at re-election? Um, what would Joe Biden do if he was challenged by Iran? knowing that if he backs down, even if it means to save the world, that he won't get reelected. All political animals care about one thing and one thing only, and that's their reelection. Very few actually <coughs> resign on matters of principle, 
um, to do the right thing, etc. Joe Biden, we know, is not a man of principle. And um, I believe that uh, he and his inner circle have waited too long to be in this position and that they're not going to um, they're not going to do anything that uh, puts it at risk and uh, letting um, letting Iran carry out nuclear blackmail against the United States and Israel um, would cost Biden any chance of being reelected. So the, the, the temptation will be there for the United States to join in on a uh, strike against, uh, against Iran, again, operating under the assumptions that the strike will succeed, that our goals and objectives will be met, and that Iran will be compelled to back down. The reality is Iran will write out the attack either with complete success or partial success. And no matter what, Iran will say, we have no choice now but to continue to not only retaliate against the United States and Israel, but to go down the path of building a nuclear weapon so that we can prevent either the United States or Israel from launching nuclear weapons against Iran. In the Congress, they're talking about $14 billion to to be sent to Israel to help them. And we know that in one night, they spent Israelis spend more than $1.2 billion with their defense system. We we don't we, we're not considering what the United States, United Kingdom, Jordan, all these countries, France has spent on this, they have spent on this uh, defensive actions. And when it comes to this type of aids going to Israel, what they're aiming at, in your opinion, if they know they already know the scale of the, the spending that any sort of escalation would cause to any of these countries. Well, first of all, we have to understand that Israel is a unique <clears throat> situation. Uh, their relationship with the United States is not matched by the relationship with any other nation. Uh, which, and, and one of the things about this relationship is that Israel is literally above the law. Um, you know, we are already supplying weapons to Israel. Uh, we have a variety of different means and mechanisms to provide these weapons. The president's spending money that has not been authorized by the U.S. Congress, uh, but the Congress isn't going to stop him because uh, they support the support of Israel. So <clears throat> Israel's right now in no danger of having um, America's lifeline be severed. If we ever threaten that, watch Israel behavioral modification. Uh, It'll be instantaneous. But Israel is convinced that we will never do that. Um, And so it doesn't matter about this vote about the 14 billion. Israel's already getting the aid. Biden has already gone around Congress. The money's flowing. Uh, This 14 billion provides money for purchasing new uh, ballistic, you know, uh, replacement uh, missiles for the Iron Dome and things of that nature. I think it would streamline the acquisition process by being uh, by being passed. But for Israel, um, you know, they're not suffering under shell shortage at this point in time. They're 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 literally being supplied from American stockpiles or stockpiles in the region, and the rules no longer apply. Whatever Israel wants, Israel gets. When it, when you look at the behavior of the Arab states in this conflict between Iran and Israel, we knew that we know that Jordan was helping Israel to defend itself, and it seems that Saudi Arabia and UAE were providing some sort of intelligence to Israel and the United States. How do you see this new behavior? Because we haven't seen a direct conflict between Iran and Israel. Right now, when when you see this type of behavior on the part of the Arab nations, how do you evaluate? How do you assess that? I think what, what's happened is that the feckless reality of these Arab leaders is being exposed to the world. Um, they have sold out to the United States a long time ago from a security standpoint. Um, and like any muscle behavior, um, you know, learned muscle behavior, muscle memory, when under stress, you, you fall back on what you're used to. Um, We saw Jordan, you know, shoot down this. We saw Saudi Arabia shoot down. They don't know how to say no to the United States. Egypt doesn't know how to say no to the United States. Um, Nobody knows how to say no to the United States except Iran. 
<laughs> you know, Syria, yes, but they're part of the uh, axis of resistance. Uh, Hezbollah, of course, but the the nations that the United States has called regional allies for decades, um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> can't stand up to the United States. Um, it'd be interesting to learn more about where the airplanes that interdicted Iranian missiles over Jordan came from. Because Kuwait and uh, Gutter had both said that you aren't allowed to use our facilities to attack Iran. But what did they do when we took those planes off anyways and sent them to shoot down? Did they shut down the air base? Did they uh, send guards out to surround American aircraft? Uh, no. And what happens if Israel wants to attack uh, Iran? And we said, well, okay, but we're going to put refueling capability up over Iraq and cover it with American combat air patrols um, to so that Israel can carry out this attack and we can protect these refuelers. Isn't that a participation in the attack? Of course it is. But are they going to stop us from doing this? I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> these are feckless people who stand for nothing other than their personal ambition. History will judge them. I think history will judge the King of Jordan very harshly. History will judge the Saudi government very harshly. Um, because had they learned to say no, had they learned to stand up, we might not see the situation spinning out of control the way it is. The other thing would be the condition that we are witnessing in the Strait of Hormuz, that it's much more important than the Red Sea. And in your opinion, with this attack on Israel, that Iran said that we are done with this and we are not going to continue this conflict. Do you think that they're going to stop these activities in the Strait of Hormuz and letting everybody pass the Strait? No, absolutely not. Um, look, Iran helped empower the Ansarallah movement, the Houthi, to shut down the Bab al Mendeb Strait, uh, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, uh, very successfully. But what's been happening is that <clears throat> these feckless uh, Arab leaders uh, in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia have agreed to allow their ports to be open to um, Israeli container ships, and that uh, these container ships will be offloaded and then be uh, dispatched to Israel through Jordan, um, <clears throat> thereby opening up a lifeline uh, for economic sustainment on the part of Israel. And so Iran, once they recognize this happen is happening, they have to undertake actions that um, they close down this lifeline. The whole idea is to starve Israel economically so that they will understand the inevitability of defeat and will withdraw troops from uh, Gaza, allow a ceasefire so the hostages can be released, et cetera. Uh, so I don't think Iran's going to stop doing that. And I think if people try to prevent them, uh, anybody comes out with an anti-piracy type statement, um, Iran will retaliate and ultimately Iran will shut down the Strait of Hormuz. Uh, 